same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when we read about these amazing things that these men and women of God did in years gone by, we're not reading it like students in a history lesson. We're reading it as soldiers about to get our marching orders. It's meant to stir something in us for what's available to us because the same God who did it then is wanting to do it again for the glory of his name. And we get to partner in that. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to put it up just yet. But as I say, I'm speaking about, I'm preaching this message, but I'm probably preaching to the preachers. Because if you've got a teenager, or if you have been through a household and your parents have spent time driving you to school, you've probably heard this sermon before, where you've said to your teenager, and, and you know you've got that one responsibility, like with my daughter Ams, to, to teach her how to adult. And so what you try and do is you try and take those moments, and it's often in the drive to school, and you say, you know, there's a day coming where you're not going to be uh, living with mom and dad, and we won't be paying for everything you need to buy, like the chocolates or this or whatever else you need, or, you know, we won't be there to clean up your room. You're going to need to do that yourself. And so we start to have these sort of conversations, and the eyes roll, and then we come out with that, that wise, parently wisdom, where we say something like, you know, if you want to accomplish something great, it's going to require some hard work. And they roll their eyes and think, no, Dad, I'm reading the four-day, four-hour work week book. And, you know, they've got their own concepts of what life will look, look like uh, and not always taking from the example of mom and dad. Or maybe we use that other dad phrase that we like to say, if it were easy, everyone would do it. Have you heard that before? Because if it was easy, everyone would do it. And so we say this because we're, trying to, we're not trying to scare them. We're not trying to intimidate them. We're not trying to put anxiety into them. But what we're trying to do is build a robustness into them, a little bit of fortitude, a little bit of character that they can know that whatever the hard things that come, they are able to see through and accomplish something great because there's this ability and capacity that's been built into them. And so that's what we do in these moments with our kids. But in the same way, our Heavenly Father wants to see this happen in you and I. And we want to live a life, if you want to live a life that glorifies God and that accomplishes something great and significant for the kingdom, there are going to be some hard things you're going to have to navigate. There's going to be some struggles that we're going to go through. And if you're a little bit like me, you think, well, maybe it's just this moment, and if I ignore it or if I try and go around it or if I just wait long enough or close my eyes, I'll fall out at the other end of the season of struggle and everything will be bliss. But the real reality is this. You know what's on the other side of seasons of hard things? More seasons with hard things. They're going to keep coming. So what the Lord does is he builds us up that we can navigate not only still harbors. We call to navigate rough seas and still get to where we call to be. So how do we do this? It's, it's great to, to say that. It's great to share that. But the reality is what does this look like? I want to start by saying something I don't believe it looks like. I believe sometimes when talking about rough situations, we can be a little bit guilty of this in the church. We try and give people an, a ticket to escape, that they don't need to face hard things where we say, you know what, if you, if you give your life to the Lord, it's going to be ease, it's going to be comfort, and the Holy Spirit's going to roll out the red carpet for you, and it's going to be great. Or we say, you know what, if you, if you come to the Lord, it's gonna, everything's going to be about prosperity, and there's going to be all of this that comes. And don't get me wrong, I love prosperity. I 100% believe that God wants to and that he's looking for every opportunity to surprise you with his goodness and bless you. He wants to take care of you. He loves to do this. But the challenge is sometimes we can look for what he is providing us and it causes us to be independent, rather than seeing it's not about what he's providing, but recognizing that he is our provision, and it builds intimacy towards him. And so there's something very different that we need to look here. We aren't called to be immune to hard things. So this is what I really want to say. This is what I, the crux of what I'm saying today, if you want to take a one-liner. As believers, we're not called to escape hard things. As believers, we're called to become experts at hard things. I love what Rassi has done with the Springbok team. Jacques Nianaba has done with the Springbok team. And you know, I spoke about Kwazuli in, in, in New Zealand. They're suffering what they call the, the Boklash. The, the, yeah. Anyway, 
I won't go there and we'll leave them, grace to them. But I love that what they've done there is they've, they've he's created an ability that they can go through hard times, struggles, they can be in the cauldron, and they just don't stop, they keep going. And a lot of the players that we see doing that had lost 50-something points a few years ago. But there's something that shifted between that hard time, struggle, hard thing, and this. And what's the difference? What's taking place there? I believe it's this for us is that sometimes when we face, as I say, those rough waters, sometimes God does part, part the waters. We know he does. But sometimes he, he, he's the God who can move mountains. He's the God that can straighten any path. He's the God that can part any waters. But sometimes he doesn't part the waters. Sometimes he gives you grace and strength and capacity and ability that you can build the boat and row it to where you need to go. Sometimes he's not just doing it to you, but he's wanting to do it in you and through you. And so this is something that I trust the Lord would want to speak to us today, because sometimes the strengthening happens in the struggles, not just for the struggles. It's happening in those moments, not just for those moments. So when we look at the Apostle Paul, I mean, he's someone who, who probably faced the most struggles and hardships that we can see definitely in the New Testament. And we, we see that he navigates this over and over and over, and he ch achieves something phenomenal for the body of Christ, for the King for his Lord and Savior, from which he never flinches, but is always faithful. And it's such a joy to him. And he says, you know what, I could go and it would be better if I do, but I know it's be I, I must stay here. It's gonna be better for you if I do. And so there's this um, abundance in him, but this obedience as well. And it plays through all these moments. And so my sermon title is Stronger Than the Struggle. If, if you wanted a different phrase, it should have been stronger in the struggle because there's strength being built in that moment. There's a book, if I had a subtitle, it would be this, Do Hard Things. Can I say to you, do hard things, do it. There's a book title, uh, it's a secular book, it's called Do Hard Things by Steve McNeese, and he's a, a sports performance expert, he's a, a sports scientist, and he says, you know what, Tough times aren't maybe like we approached the World Cup in 2003, uh, Camp Stoldralt, whatever it was called, where whoever survives gets to play for the Springboks. It's not one of those moments. He's saying, no, tough times aren't just to see the survival of the fittest, but tough times are brilliant moments to refocus and to cultivate something that causes you to be stronger for the next moment that comes. This is a quote from the book, real toughness is not about callous bravado, but instead it's the ability to navigate difficulty with grace and unwavering focus on what matters. I love that. No matter what you're in, and I know that there's some of you here that you're in hard times, and I don't want to minimize that, but I want to say that there's grace for you to focus on what matters so that you can navigate through truth through the times that you might be facing. And so I want to speak a little bit about these hard things, and I trust that the hardest thing for you today is not having to bear with the sermon, but I trust that it blesses you and that it inspires you and it causes an abundance in you that you leave richer and fuller than you came in. So 2 Corinthians 11.21, let's put it on the screen. And let me give you a little bit of context. At this time, there are these other apostles that are going parading around, and they're bringing themselves across as these super apostles. One translation calls them egomaniacs where they're teaching falsehoods and they're presenting a false gospel and they're speaking about how great they are because how great everything is going for them. And the apostle Paul gets frustrated by this because he sees it's frivolous and it's false and there's no substance. And so in this, we're going to see a little bit of the sarcasm coming out where he says, if they boast, I can boast about everything they're boasting, but my boasting is going to be a little bit different. And he proceeds to unfold that. So let's read. Whatever anyone dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. Now he's going to shift into what really being an apostle, a man of God, a kingdom man or woman looks like. And he says, I am more, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. If you see Paul getting on a ship with you, don't go. That's my encouragement. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea. I can't point any further. At danger from false believers. Anywhere you look, he's been in danger. Verse 27. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides anything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led to sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of all these things that show my weakness. And later on, he goes on to say that I boast about my weakness so that Christ's strength can rest on me. That's the outworking that we read later. But the reason I'm bringing this is because we find ourselves in a day and an age where we felt an influence coming. It's this post-modernity. It's living with Western influence that affects us societally, and it's contributed a bit of weakness to them. And I want to put up my hand and take some responsibility for this because we live in a day and age where we want everything handed to us. Me too. And I'm a Gen Xer, and don't look too... uh, too much at me with condemnation. I see a couple other Gen Xs out there as well. But my generation is called the Gen Xs, and we, we kind of are responsible for that microwave thinking. I want it done well, and I want it done now. And here's the reality, and I see many that would be uh, in these categories as well. If we look at the baby boomers, and if we look at the tra- traditionalists, these were the people that stormed the beaches of Normandy. These were the people that brought us through the Industrial Revolution. They endured hardship after hardship, after hardship, after hardship. And often today, we're a little bit more concerned about what our Facebook posts have made us feel like than we are with storming any beach in any military zone anywhere. And I trust that we were a little bit shaken out of that if we watched Top Gun Maverick. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, but I see that the recruitment for the Air Force has gone up since that came out, (laughs) truthfully. I've actually got a relative who signed up. But you know, this is, uh, this, this is what's happened uh, before Top Gun. We had grown a little bit weak. We want the easy way out. I mean, and we can blame Amazon, and we can blame Take A Lot, and we can blame Uber Eats and Checkers um, 60. You know, I know it's a little bit different when you're living this close to the Karoo and all that uh, there is with hunting and that. But if one of you uh, who's a hunter said, George, go out and shoot something and bring it back so we can eat, I'm going to be like, are you crazy? I'm from Durban. I've got my cell phone, iPhone. I've got an app, and I'm going to order a steak. How do you want it done? They will deliver it. Because that's the way we like to operate. Because we're looking for minimal effort with maximum return. That's the culture we're living in. Minimal effort, maximum return. You know, I want to graduate college and I immediately want to be earning a 60,000 rand a month income. Why? Because I deserve it. Minimal effort, maximum return. And my concern is if, if, if that's happening in the culture, we need to be aware that it can be bleeding into the church as well. And we need to make sure that it doesn't happen on our watch. Firstly, we need to make sure that we're not signing up for that and saying, yeah, that's the, the, the area I want to be in. We need to be knowing, I mean, we want to be those that say, not on my watch, we're going to be those who are on the front lines taking ground for the kingdom, not sitting back apathetically, just trusting everything to be given to us. We have been, be, been given provision in Christ, everything we need to live a life of godliness and fullness. But we've got to go out and do the living. We've been given everything we need for that, but there's living to be done. And so this, this challenge comes, and when you look through the Bible, you will see it. Through every page and every story, there's men and women of God who had this resoluteness, they had this conviction, they had this grit, they had this resilience, they had this, I'm gonna take ground, it doesn't matter how hard, it doesn't matter how difficult, it doesn't matter how intimidating, it doesn't matter how challenging the moment is because my God is bigger than that which I'm facing and I wanna live as a showpiece for his grace and his goodness. And so they start to step up and step out. And so with God's help, I want to encourage you with his help. He's an ever-present help in times of need. I don't know what you might be facing, but this message isn't to bash you, it's to inspire you. That with God's help, that you can do hard things 
and that as you're doing the hard things, you think, George, you're not selling me this right now. I'm not trying to sell it to you, but I do want to encourage you that as you do hard things, it's in the doing, it's in that place of doing hard things that amazing things happen, glorious things happen, miraculous things happen, life-altering and defining things happen. Destinies unfold. Too many of us are hiding away from the hard thing and we're missing the God thing that he's wanting to do. And listen, I, I, like a, I like preaching the messages where God does the hard things through us. That's the ones that I get the most amens for. So they tickle me uh, personally, uh, internally. I feel joy in doing that. But we can't shy away from this. That sometimes, as I've said, God doesn't want to just do that for us. He wants to do that through us so that we begin to be a blessing. Not only so that I come to be blessed at church, but that when you leave this place, you are a blessing going somewhere to happen because you're carrying the fullness of all that God is imparting to you as we sit here. So there's a difference between getting a blessing and being a blessing going somewhere to happen. And some of you are here today and you might be in the place where before you there's some hard things and some challenges and some struggles and you just sense that the Lord's working on you saying, no, you need, to, you need to lean into those. You need to step into that. You need to take some ground. That might be you. You know it's ahead of you. And there are others of us here that know we're right in the middle of it. I'm right in the middle of this challenge. And God wants you to know that you can endure it and that not only can you endure it, but you can be accelerated through and out of it. But it's with His presence and with His grace and with His help. And so, we, we want to find the encouragement that comes in that. Maybe to pick up in your studies or getting that skill set. Maybe it's to mend that relationship that's been broken and you can't comprehend how to do it because there's been so much damage. Maybe it's to run that 40K marathon and get healthy. No, it can't be that one. I'll go on to the next. <laughs> Maybe it's to start a business or to write a book. It was too quiet after that one. Maybe God's pressing something in your nose areas because if it was easy everyone would do it. And the reason that God is challenging us is because most likely it's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard, but when you step out in faith, there's a beautiful things that happen as you do the hard thing. You're getting an, a, an amazing accompanying um, outworking that we're going to see as we read from Peter, who also faced some challenges. First Peter 5, 6 to 10. Let's see what happens as we start to step out, step forward, what happens and comes alongside us. Verse 6. It says, therefore, we do have it on the screen, I think. Do we have, uh, we, yes, excellent. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So it's saying these hard things are happening everywhere. But here is how we handle them. Here's how we cultivate something in the hard times. So this is the part you need to, you need to hear. Please, you need to hear these next few words. After you have suffered for a little while. It's not going to be forever. It's not going to be prolonged. It's after you have suffered for a little while. The God of all grace. Not some grace. Not just a measure of grace or a portion of grace. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, now watch, here the four words, and I just want to focus on these before I come into finish. He will perfect, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. I want you to hear this. If you are going into a hard time, if you are in the middle of a hard time, this is what God will do. He will perfect you, he will confirm you, he will strengthen you and he's going to establish you. And the order of that is so important because often we think, Lord, I want you to perfect me, confirm me, strengthen me, establish me, and then I'm going to do the hard thing. That's not what it's saying. After you've endured this for a little while, God steps in with all of his encompassing grace and he perfects you, he confirms you, he strengthens you, and he establishes you. So here, like Gideon, We've got to go in the strength we have. And then God pitches up in the strength that he has. Because it's in the, you, as you go, you grow. Some of us are waiting, but the reality is this. It's as you go, you grow. So he says, after you've suffered a little while. And that word suffered, it means to experience a sensation or impression of pain. I'm not going to read it in the Greek. But it's saying it's through that 
following that moment that God steps in and does what he does. So let's look at those first, those four words, sorry. The first one is this, he perfects you. When you are doing hard things, God steps up. When you take that stand to do it, God steps in and he says, now it's my turn. You've been doing it and now I'm gonna step in and my job kicks in. And he says, I'm gonna perfect you. Now, wives, I apologize. This isn't saying that your husband is going to be perfection. And there's a sigh of disappointment, I know. But what this is saying is that there's a work of perfecting happening. It's the Greek word katarizo, and it means to restore, means to prepare, means to equip. It means to fit or to frame. It's like when you put something on the potter's wheel and you make it and it loses its shape. And then in the midst of that, you restore its shape again and you continue to prepare it and work it, work it so it'll be fit for use. And so the first word we see there when we're talking about this word katarizo, perfect, it means restoration. There's going to be a restoring. I know it's a word for the year for us as Freedom Hill and for you as Victory Church, restoring. It's actually the same word, exactly the same word, this word perfect, and the word um, that we're going to read is used in Mark 1.19. And Jesus goes to his disciples and he says this, and it'll help us understand this word a bit better. He says, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending, katarizo, that word perfecting, the nets. Now, why were they mending, katarizo, restoring or perfecting the nets? It's because the nets had been used. They had been worn down. They had been in rough seas catching rough fish and hauling in a rough catch. And so, these nets needed to be restored because they had been active and they had been in these challenging times. But here's something I want you to catch. It's not only that they were restoring the nets back to what they should be, it says that it was for the next day. They weren't only being restored because of what they had been through, but they were being prepared for what they were going to go through, go to. And so the next phrase there is preparation. And so when he perfects you, there's a re restoration and a preparation. So this year, as God is working with you as victory and us as Freedom Hill, there's a restoration and a preparation, restoring because of what has been and a preparing for what's ahead. That's what hap is happening as he brings this perfecting. And we need to understand that it's a process, a process. When we do hard things, God's promises come in the process. It's this process of the mending, the restoring, and the preparation. There's a process that unfolds. When you look at your life and you look back at who you used to be and who you are now, you, you might think these are, I'm worlds apart from who I was because there was a process that unfolded that you were prepared for because of where you were that got you to where you are now. Maybe if you look back five years ago, what you were doing that, what you went through then prepared you for what you're doing now. When you look at the Springboks five years ago, however many when we were being beaten by 50 points, what we went through then was preparing us for the victory that we were able to walk in last night. So it's a process. It's a journey. It's a perfect, perfection. We see Joseph was thrown in the pit long before he made it to the palace. The pit was the process for the palace. We see David in a similar place. Before he had to sit on a throne, he had to sit in a field. Before he could shepherd a nation, he had to shepherd some sheep. There was a process that had to take place where there was a preparing for what God was wanting to work. So number one, he perfects us, restoring and preparing. And number two, he confirms and he strengthens you. He confirms and strengthens you. Now, you might say, George, why are you putting two words together? Um, because in the Greek, the, the root word there is the word histamine. And I've heard Pastor Louis share an amazing word on that before. And I just want to pick up on something that he said there. When you look at this word histamine, it's, as I say, the root word for confirm and strengthen. And it actually has five meanings. In the English, you know, we, we, we don't really express as much as in the original Greek, that's why we go back and look. And there's five meanings that spring out as we look at it. And it means this, the first one is this, that when, you, when he confirms and strengthens you, this is what's happening. Number one, he's gonna cause, cause you to stand and to be placed in position. When you step forward to do that hard thing, God is gonna cause you to stand up. Doesn't matter what's happening, what you're going through. As you say, yes, Lord, I'm up for this. He's gonna cause you to stand up and he's gonna position you in such a way that you are upright and able to accomplish the very thing that he's purposed for you. In the midst of the hard thing. The second thing he's gonna do, and I love this one, he's gonna stand next to you. He doesn't just stand you up, but he comes 
and he stands next to you. He says, I am near you. This might be hard, but you can know and you can rely and you can be certain and secure in this. I am with you. And then number three, he says, I'm gonna give you balance. It's a little bit like watching the Springboks. You know, when you saw Malcolm Marks running at the line and charging, he was standing upright, but you would see an Ibn Etzebeth near him standing alongside, and he was giving him balance and pushing him through all black front rankers. That's what's happening then. God is saying, when you, I'm going to cause you to stand up. When you say, I'll do this hard thing, I'll cause you to stand up. I'm going to position you to accomplish what you need to do. I'm going to stand next to you, and then I'm going to give you balance. Nothing's going to sway you, move you. Nothing's going to intimidate you and cause you to be double-minded. You're going to have balance because, number four, I'm going to make you immovable. Nothing's going to shift you. Sorry, I'm going to a lot of rugby. I love rugby. It's like Bali Swat. When he was in the 95 World Cup France on the, the line, we were getting pushed back. And he turned to Kubis Visa and he said, you can go left, you can go right, you can go up, you can go down, you can go forward, but we're not going backwards. And we didn't uh, in that day as well. He makes us immovable. And the fourth thing is to stand unharmed. He's saying, you're going to be safe and sound. He says, I'm going to cause you to stand. And then I'm going to stand alongside you. I'm gonna give you balance. I'm gonna make you immovable and you're gonna be safe and unharmed because I'm with you. And if anyone comes at you, they've gotta come at me first. Have you ever seen how brave um, one of our little scrum halves are when they're standing behind Etzebeth in front of them? They are chirpy and tenacious. And that's how we can be in the midst of the hard time knowing God is with us. So what's our role as we read these five things that God does as we're in hard times? Here's, here's your role. And here's my role. Here's for you as victory, for us as Freedom Hill. Here's the encouragement. Do hard things. God's role is to do those five things we've mentioned. Your role, do hard things. But I want to bring a caution here. Because when I say that, we can rush out of this place, and this can be a dangerous sermon where we can go into striving and working and trying to make it happen all in our own strength. And when we do that, we can ruin marriages and we can cause families to be left, in a sense, orphaned because we're not present, and we can bring destruction when we do that. See, there's a healthy way to do it in the kingdom. When we call to do hard things as believers, there's a way that we can do it that brings life. You see, here's the challenge. God's hard work, apart from God's empowerment, leads to hard falls. God's hard work can be godly. God's hard work, apart from God and grace's empowerment, can cause us to experience hard falls. And so sometimes we blame God and we said, but we thought you told us that. He did. But he said, with my grace, with my presence, in my rest, you can accomplish these hard things, not to go out and do them as ourselves. And so we need to see the difference and to categorize that as we look at it in a healthy way to do this. And uh, here we can see it in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, it's expressed for us. Here's the key element of how we do it. It says, after you have suffered for a little while, here's the next five words, the God of all grace. I love that. I said that. It's, it's not, he is the God of all grace, not a measure, not a portion, not just a, a little percentage. The God of all grace comes. And, and when we look at this word grace, it's not just talking about salvation. It is wonderfully that. But it's talking about his favor and his anointing and his empowerment and his um, enablement, and his ability and capacity that is at work within us to do way more than we can do in our own ability and capacity. And so he's saying, when you come into alignment with me, then you can move into your assignment with grace and anointing to be able to do this thing fruitfully. When you are out of alignment, have you ever had your back out? If your back is out and you are out of alignment, there's no assignment you can do because you can barely walk, there's no strength. But it's in the alignment the assignment comes that we can accomplish these things. And so we need to be saying, Lord, what are you saying to us? And Lord, we position ourselves to receive your grace. And what's the measuring stick? We can often think it's the hard work that produces the rewards. We can think, you know, I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna get the degree. We can think I'm gonna work at that company for 10 years and then I'm gonna get the gold pen and I'm gonna get the promotion. And we focus on the outcome and we focus on what we do. But the measuring stick is not what we do. The measuring stick is how we are doing while we're doing it. Here's the measuring stick to keep you in health. It's not what you do. It's how you are doing it, how you are doing while you're doing it. That's why we see Mark, Michael Hooper, captain of Australia, he pulled back. He said, you know, I am not doing so well in doing this. doesn't matter if they, they 
routed the, the um, Argentinians, it matters that he wasn't doing well. And this is really the pinnacle of self-care and mental health. And it's truth, this is the truth of how we determine it. When we look at what we're doing, we know a tree by the fruit. You'll know where, where you planted by the fruit that's being born. And if you do hard things in Christ with His grace, the fruit you produce will be peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Listen, they might not be evident at every moment when you're being cut off by a taxi or someone steals your parking or bumps your, uh, gives you a fender bender, then maybe in that moment, sure, uh, that might not be the fruit, but it's really something that in the, the day-to-day is defining you. It's not absent. But when you're doing hard work and the fruit is that you're exhausted, burned out, angry, unhealthy, out of balance, no one can be around you. They're terrified of you. Then you know that you are producing bad fruit and you've got to check your roots. And in that moment, it's possibly because you're not embracing the grace that has already been made available to you. Or it's because you're not aligned with the Lord and His assignment. And so you start to do things out of alignment. And, and I love this, when it says he confirms you and he strengthens you, that Greek word strengthen there, it's, it's speaking about strengthening one's soul, your mind, will, and emotions. You know what is most often the thing that keeps us from doing hard things? It's our feelings that form our thoughts that stop us from going there, mind, will, and emotions. I don't feel like going to gym, so I think I'll just skip it today because who really needs legs day? My legs are fine. And so then we don't actually go and we don't do this thing. And he says here, as we read, um, that he, he strengthens us. And when it's speaking about here, it's, it's speaking about strengthening our soul. And I love this because he is strengthening the very thing that's gonna keep you from doing the hard thing. He says, I strengthened your mind, will, and emotions. As you step up, as you say, it's hard, but I'm gonna do it. He comes alongside, he works in us, and he strengthens the very thing that would keep us from doing the hard thing. Because he's working in our mind, he's working in our will, he's working in our emotions, that we come into agreement with heaven's assignment. That's why Paul can say in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's why we can say today in our translation as we're looking at this message, I can do hard things through Christ who gives me strength. And the third point I want to bring today is he says, which is actually the fourth in those four words, he's going to establish you. And in the Greek, it's this word, themelo, and it means I'm going to lay a foundation in you. I'm going to found you. I'm going to make you stable. I'm going to settle you. And the challenge is we want to see fruit for our work. You know, we're going to work hard, and then we want to look out, out the window, and we want to see what we built going up vertically high, glass, and shining brightly in a city landscape. We want to see the result of our hard work. But what God's saying, no, there's something about the foundations. There's something about the deep parts, where deep calls unto deep, where there's an establishing and a securing that's gonna cause you to be immovable. And when we get our focus wrong, that's the reason why we build high, but these, these things we've built come crumbling down. So God's promise is this, you step up and out in the hard thing that you know I'm calling you to do, and I'm gonna be working in you, I'm gonna be with you, and I'm gonna be establishing you. These things are all taking place as we do it. And it, it is the, the encouragement I wanna bring, even as we come today to take communion. I'm gonna ask the team that are doing communion, I know it's your communion Sunday, if you can get ready to do that. And if there's anyone that wants to play on a keyboard, please feel free to come up, I'm gonna pray. Um, in just a moment for us and lead us in that moment. Thank you. I've spoken a lot, said a lot of words, but I just really believe the Holy Spirit wants to prod a few hearts. There are some of us here who have been going through a hard time. There's some families who have been struggling. Some businesses that have taken knocks. And I want to speak to you. Either you might be in the middle of that thing and you feel like you're enduring it. Or you might be knowing that there's something required of you going forward. And when you've gone to the Lord and you sought Him, He said, you know what, son? You know what, daughter? Daughter? 
I know you're in the middle of this. But I'm not going to part the waters this time. I can do it, but that would be robbing you. I've said before, sometimes the breakthrough breaks you if you're not ready for it. But sometimes you have to have the break before you get the breakthrough. There's got to be a break before the breakthrough. That's why Gideon, in the moment where the Lord wants to show his glory, says, don't go in your strength. Go in what appears like weakness. My strength will come to bear. All you do is you break those jars, and I'll bring the breaking of the enemy's army. Sometimes there's a break before the breakthrough. And you might be feeling that you're breaking in this moment. But if you'll acknowledge who he is, he's always present. Sometimes we need to just be present to his presence. If you're able to say, Lord, this is a hard time, but I know I'm meant to be here. Then I want to say that he's going to come and he's going to cause you to stand up. He's going to position you so you can accomplish what he has for you. He's going to bring a balance and an equilibrium that you can roll with the rolls. And he's going to make you immovable. And he says, you know what? I'm going to establish you and I'm going to protect you. And in this, I'm restoring and there's recovering and there's preparation and it's for a purpose because what seems weaker is getting stronger and what seems backward is going to be forward and it's going to be a kingdom upside down, weakness filled with grace so strength can rest and you can be a display of my goodness, but you've got to be ready to step in because he's already been through his hard thing. And through his hard thing, his strength was manifest. And there's grace available. And you're holding the reality of that in your hands right now. You see, there was a breaking of his body, the bread, which prepared the breakthrough that we get to live in. So won't you now just take the bread in your hands, just break it and take it. Because as we come to communion, this isn't just a, a religious symbol or a ritual to be observed. It's a blessing to be received. So just receive of this break. We thank you, Lord, that even as we do this, Jesus, we thank you for what we have available in you. We forget not all your benefits, that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. And Lord, even as we do that, I thank you, Lord, that right now where there's people that maybe have been um, attacked in health and attacked in uh, mental health and attacked in their emotions. I thank you that by your stripes we are healed and this chastisement you have brought, uh, carried upon your shoulders has brought us peace. And so I just declare that over us as a community right now. And Lord, we thank you for your blood. That as we take of your blood, it speaks a better word. That it's a de declaration of victory that we overcome by your blood. And that no matter the accusation that comes, you speak a better word over us. And so we just take of the cup right now. And Lord, I just pray that for those of us who are needing to endure, that you, you come and we leave with just the life of your presence as we've read of, uh, of, out of this passage of 1 Peter, that there will be life to go forward in us, carrying us. But also, Lord, for those of us who know that there are things ahead, I pray that you give us focus to see the joy that's set beyond the pain for what you're wanting to do, not only in us, but through us. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, that we are blessings going somewhere to happen. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.